I've been fixed on tanks for many years now, scribbling little tanks on the sides of textbooks in school times, playing computer games with tanks almost exclusively. Once in 5th or 6th grade I even tried to design my own computer game with 2D tanks, which never materialized outside of the paper sheets because I was too distracted and uh, impatient child. But there comes time in life when you realize I could build a tank myself. So I did order a 135 scale model kit, you know, the one you glue, paint and put somewhere on the display. And it so happens that it has more than enough space to fit a Raspberry Pi Zero inside. So I did some more measurements and ordered two DC motors with 100 to 1 gear ratio. The reason for the gear ratio was I want this tank to move realistically. And the motors did fit real well. I only had to adjust the holes a little bit with a metal file and I did fix motors with poor man's 3D printer, hot glue. And uh, after gluing all the other wheels and putting on the rubber tracks, which by the way, don't take them for granted, not every model kit has rubber tracks, I did connect the power supply and uh, to my surprise, the sprocket wheel did move the tracks, which uh, I wasn't sure of that because of this thin plastic out of which it is made. At this point, I did order a few more components. Dual channel motor driver to supply motors with an external power source separate from Raspberry, two 3.7 volt LiPo batteries, one for the motors and one for the Raspberry, five volt step-up converter to power the Raspberry from LiPo, two LiPo chargers, surprisingly not only for charging the battery, but for safe discharging. LiPo batteries tend to experience irreversible damage if their voltage drops to less than 2.5 volts and this charger works like an interface in between. It cuts the current if it's too low. And lastly, 360 degrees digital servo to rotate the turret. In the meantime, I started painting and yes, I'm aware this is not a historically accurate camouflage, but screw that, that's the least exciting part of this tank. I used the first one for the base, the second one for the brownish stripes and the third one for faking metal parts. The metallic paint really did surprise me as it adds to the details which are even more emphasized by playing with light. I wish I did spend some time researching how to paint things properly instead of improvising. But anyway, I got the parts and started making the software for controlling the tank. I settled with the following design. No apps. Apps are inconvenient because you need to make artifacts for all platforms. .app for Android, .epa for iOS, and so on, and that even assuming that you use one of those right ones run everywhere technologies. You need to distribute artifacts, no comment required, and you need to install artifacts, which sounds like a made up inconvenience, but the reality is if you don't put the application on the official store of your platform, be it Google Play or Apple's App Store, which obviously requires a developer account, installing will be a pain in the ass. Instead, Raspberry runs an HTTP server with a website that exposes tank controls. Website uses gRPC web for communication with the backend and a library called nipple.js for on-screen joysticks. Initially, I wanted to use IMG UI.js for displaying the controls. I imagined a full dashboard with the tank displayed in the center with current track direction with some graphs displaying power consumption, temperature, but eventually I came to my senses. The first assumption. Raspberry exposes Wi-Fi access point. User needs to connect to it in order to control the tank, meaning that there is no need to know the IP address of the tank and no need for service detection. DNS server hosted on Raspberry will take care of translating HTTP tank into HTTP 192.168.1.1. Lastly, tank control backend application uses C++, PyGPIO for PWM control, gRPC for communication, and CMake as a build system. Also, note that there is a gRPC proxy service between backend and frontend, because from what I understand, gRPC web is not a real gRPC, so there must be a middleman translating the communication. The code is really trivial, so I won't even bother covering it here. Link to the GitHub repository is in the description if you want to have a look. The only somewhat amusing thing was translating joystick position into signal for individual motors, how the tank moves, boils down to the PWM signal that is sent to the motor driver, which can range from 0 to 100%, and that's the exact request that the server accepts. A floating point ranging from 0 to 1 for the left motor, and a floating point ranging from 0 to 1 for the right motor. When turning left, left track goes backward, right track goes forward. When turning right, left track goes forward, right track goes backward. Both forward when moving forward, both backward for moving backward. 
Now, how do I handle everything in between those extreme states? Well, I came up with this formula, which does the exact thing. A plot of it would probably say more. The x-axis is the angle of joystick, while the y-axis is the output to the motor. You can clearly see the two overlap when pointing the joystick directly upwards and directly downwards, meaning both motors go either up or down. At the same time, there are points where outputs are opposite. That's when the joystick points directly left and right. What was left is adding a systemd entry, so to auto start scripts that run the backend server, gRPC proxy and the HTTP server. As a note, I'm using default pre-installed Python 3 module to run the HTTP server. It's a good trick to know, helps when you want to copy some files without setting up SSH, FTP or SMB. Also, the very last thing, making the Raspberry start in access point mode. Remembering to add a manual DNS entry to make tank resolve to the Raspberry's IP address. The software part was done, but there was one problem, boot time. It took 34 seconds for the Raspberry to boot and even more for the access point to show up, so I started looking for any potential optimizations. Fortunately, Vanilla Raspbian comes with many services that I simply do not need in this case. Keyboard setup service that handles keyboard layout, Avahi for service discovery, Bluetooth service, those are things that do impact boot time which can be safely disabled. So I turned them off, but the impact was short of intimidating. I saved 3 seconds. Another thing, a little bit trickier, is to recompile the kernel with unused features disabled during configuration. It may sound complicated, but the build process is documented on the Raspberry Pi website. I cloned the kernel repository, ran the make config target, and started from disabling things I was absolutely certain I don't need. GPU, HDMI, USB, IPv6, kernel debugging, file system debugging, support for file systems other than ext4, input, mouse, keyboard, touchscreen, joystick, I changed kernel compression method to LZ4, changed boot params to make kernel locks less verbose, then I iteratively disabled things I am not certain of and checked if the system still boots. All in all, the resulting kernel was 4.2 megabytes. In comparison, the vanilla kernel shipped with current Raspbian is 5.8 megabytes. So that's already the last time spent on sure reading from SD card. After putting the SD card with switched kernel back to the Raspberry, boot time reduced to 22 seconds, with kernel time alone down from 5 seconds to 1 second. The very last and least significant thing I did was to add initial turbo equals to 15 to the boot config TXT, which overclocks the CPU, but only for the initial 15 seconds of boot time. It doesn't change much because the biggest bottleneck here is still the SD card, not the CPU. And SD card that I use is one of the worst possible in terms of both read and write speed. Just look at this benchmark. My microSD reads at the rate of 6 megabytes per second, while the one just above is already at 8 megabytes per second, which means that the best optimization left on the table is to just buy a better SD card. But I don't care that much. What I would like to do if I ever decide to make another iteration of this tank is to use a 3D printed gears for engine transmission. It would allow me to install engines vertically instead of horizontally, saving a lot of space, allowing for smaller model kits to be used and cleaner in general. Same goes for the turret. The turret ring could be fitted with racks, so a single DC motor installed neatly in the hole could make it rotate without gluing anything permanently. The amount of hot glue used could fill a bathtub. I regret using a 100 to 1 gear ratio in DC engines, considering I feed them with 3.7 volts, it's too slow. I've seen 75 to 1 gear ratio motors and I think the tank dynamics would be much better without making it ridiculously fast. Another thing that 3D printer would allow me, torsion bars. Torsion bars do amortization and make the tank go way smoother, just look at this video of the Panther tank. The design of a torsion bar is very simple. An obstacle, let's say a rock, will apply force upwards, which in turn will make the bar to rotate, applying torque on the spring. Simple and effective. Also in the end I decided not to mount the two LiPo charging PCBs inside the tank, so there is no protection against discharging the battery below 2.5 volts. Realistically speaking I would have to spend a lot of time to discharge the battery, but I still count this as a potential place for improvement. 